<laughs> Good evening and uh, welcome to the 20th R&D Salon. I can't believe it's already 20. My name is Paola. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Trying our best. <laughs> My name is Paola Antonelli and I work here at MoMA in the Department of Architecture and Design and also in the Department of Research and Development. As you know the refrain, it's a lot of research and very little development, but the research is done with passion and uh, the research also relies on all of you and we try as much as possible in, with Xaviera Cubara right now who's the research assistant for the department, we try to tackle uh, topics that are kind of big, like uh, truths or death, you know, just uh, we try to see how the museum uh, can help us all deal with these gigantic topics, not only by creating this sense of gathering here and the, the ability and the possibility to discuss, but also by providing us with art as a tool for deeper understanding, for deeper knowledge, for certainty for truth? Well, that's what we're here to discuss tonight. Uh, we're here to discuss truth as is provided to us and as is sought in the field of science, in the field of art, in the field of literature. We're not going to tackle all of truth. That would be totally impossible. And uh, my speakers tonight were, were mocking me saying, what did you do a brief history of truth in seven minutes? And I said, first of all, I'm going to do more than seven minutes as usual because I'm the host. So, but, um, but still, I'm not even going to attempt that. Also, I don't have such an abstract brain. I tried my best to go through philosophical concept and you'll see that I'll whiz by because thank God we have some really, really good minds that are going to do better than I can. But I'm going to start with uh, something instead very worldly and mundane, a Beretta, a Beretta Cougar 3000, 8000, 8000. This is an F because I couldn't find a D, but that's the reason why I'm showing this to you is because when I started at MoMA 23 years ago, one of the first items that I presented for acquisition, I don't know what I was thinking, was this gun. Why? Because the New York Police Department had picked it as one of the possible guns that policemen could choose from. And I was very proud that it was Italian, completely amoral. Uh, I mean, really, I don't know what I was thinking. So I presented this Beretta for acquisition. I was told, I'm sorry, we do not acquire guns. And I'm like, what? I, I said, there's a lot of guns all over the uh, walls of the museum in paintings and in, photograph in photography. And they said, yes, but this is design. Design is what you see is what you get. The function is the one that is declared. There's a certain truth. They didn't say all that. I kind of deduced, deduct, deduced all that from the rejection, from the refusal. But all of a sudden, I started thinking, yeah, design, what you see is what you get. Very interesting. And instead, when you went around the galleries of the museum, these are all photography um, uh, uh, examples that are in the collection, you would see Dangerous Weapon from 1936 or Hand with Gun from 1970, something from uh, a photo documentary from the Troubles in Ireland from 1977, all depictions of guns, but mediated by an art context that would make it so that we would, uh, would reach a deeper truth and a deeper understanding of the uh, immoral moral or negative or dangerous uh, value of guns as opposed to a Beretta in a design gallery that is instead honestly just about the function of killing. Um, also, I noticed that in the collection of MoMA was uh, a series that really talked about the truth of where I was growing up. It was the um, 18 October 1977, a painting, a series of 15 paintings by Gerhard Richter that spoke about the uh, moments in life and in death of the RAF group of uh, terrorists, of German terrorists. It was part of my life because I was a child when that happened and I remembered it. And also it was interesting to see how Richter, in his amazingly, um, in, with his amazing pictorial capability, had re produced a uh, newspaper fact report, uh, reportage, but with this aura that was almost ghost-like. So art had transcended reality, but at the same time it was giving it back to us and it was his idea of reality because nobody ever knew 
if the three members of the RAF group that were found dead in their prison cells in Germany had killed themselves or had been killed. So truth that is reproposed to us by art is very often deeper, if also uh, more um, questionable, but the question is inside us and therefore it leaves us with our own personal truth. As I was telling you, I'm going to whiz by concepts of truth because there are too many, but just three of them give you a sense of the different contexts that we can be in, the syllogism context. Uh, if something is or is not, and if it's not, it is, and you say it is, and I completely lose it then. But the Aristotle, the correspond correspondence theory of Aristotle, all the unveiling, the Aletheia um, idea that was used in ancient Greece and was also reprised by Heidegger in the 20th century, or even St. Thomas Aquinas that uh, postulated that truth is formed in our intellect. Interestingly, we can go through a real big series of examples, but it very often comes down to the separation between individual and collective. And in this beautiful dialogue between Rab Rabindranath Tagore and Albert Einstein that happened in the 1930s in uh, Albert Einstein's uh, um, uh, house near Berlin, the two discussed about the difference between science and religion and also about the truth that is formed in the individual and in the spirit as opposed to being outside of the individual and therefore belonging in science. Interestingly, um, while preparing for this salon, I got very sad. And uh, um, in the end, what made me feel more hopeful was science. And uh, I didn't expect that, but uh, this idea that something can be less questionable or at least attainable is something that I discovered being uh, the, a discussion amongst many philosophers in the 20th century and also amongst many artists. Well, of course, there's Popper that's been a reference for so many of us, the idea that truth is something that we want to seek, not certainty. But the philosopher, you know, we were discussing before with Maria Popova that I like the most because, well, she's not a philosopher only, she's a writer, but she's the one that has her feet solidly planted on the ground and, as Maria said, sometimes in her own mouth, is Hannah Arendt. Uh, Hannah Arendt wrote amazing um, books about the truth, but in particular, this article that was in The New Yorker in 1966 it's uh, 67, I'm sorry, is stunning because it could have been written last week and it could have been also in the New Yorker. She published it after Eichmann in Jerusalem, so it was a discussion about the idea of factual truth versus the truth that can be manipulated. But look at this, facts and events are infinitely more fragile things than axioms, discoveries and theories even the most wildly speculative ones produced by the human mind. Um, you should reread it because it's incredible. Philosophical truth, when it enters the marketplace, changes its nature and becomes opinion. But in particular, and I don't like usually to put quotes on the screen during presentations, but that is quite amazing. While probably no former time tolerated so many diverse opinions on religious and philosophical matters, factual truth, if it happens to oppose a given group's profit or pleasure, is greeted today with greater hostility than ever before. It would be fantastic if we could get to the end of the salon without ever naming him, but we know that that's why we're here. And this particular essay will bring you delight and also anxiety. In another, uh, in another piece that Arendt wrote in 1972, Crisis of the Republic, she talks about the importance of bearing witness, the importance of testimony, and in a way, that's what artists can provide, and writers, and photographers. And bearing witness, as we know, is one of the essential parts of making history. There are a few examples here from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa to Primo Levi and Elie Wiesel, to the mothers in Argentina, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, and we can go on forever, but bearing witness and reminding people that something happened is very important because, as Arendt says, 
the uh, ideas and truths are formed in the collective mind and it's hard to dislodge them afterwards. So one can never really let the guard down. Um, photographers and photo reportages. As we know, uh, photography has been considered for many years as the repository of truth until many untruths were discovered. And there was this great exhibition in the Bronx Documentary Center just last year, I think it was, that talked about how many photographs that were considered real were discovered to be unreal from the most famous Robert Kappa falling soldier which was recently um, found to be questionable because I'm not going to go into detail because otherwise I would take the whole night but the history is really fascinating um, not to mention the same picture of OJ Simpson that was published in Newsweek and in Time but in Time O.J. Simpson was much darker, and the, and, and the art director, Matt Mahurin, had to justify his bias in making his face considerably blacker than it was. Um, German Reichstag, Yevgeny Haldai, completely doctor picture, um, actually even to the point that he scratched the wristwatches from the soldiers because they would have given away the fact that the soldiers were not real. And instead, Paul Hansen, Gaza City, Palestinian Territories from 2012, that is an absolutely real picture, but it was slightly photoshopped to give a better sense of the perspective that the eye of the photographer would have and was therefore uh, accused to be false and then proven real. So very interestingly, Photoshop has become the instrument of falsity and uh, I was thinking today much more frivolous but today is a no makeup Monday right and uh, um, and also the um, the happiness that uh, uh, my colleagues and I had when we found a photographer that took a picture of a bikini for a catalog of an exhibition that we're preparing about fashion and left the stretch marks of the model and we were like yay so interestingly Photoshop has become almost the enemy but let's go back to serious matters um, in reality, things have not changed that much with the introduction of digital uh, means of expression and information. Because if you see here, um, 1963 and instead 2001, two amazingly important events and two ama amazingly tragic events, when it comes to the assassination of John Kennedy, we've seen one video repeated over and over and over. It was one. And Zapruder um, became really the way in which we would see that particular event. And instead, when it came to 2001, one, there were hundreds of cameras and video cameras pointed at the towers before, after, and during. And still, when there was a survey that was made a few years ago about how people stood in front of these two events, there was the same amount of people that believed that the two events were not real. So it doesn't matter if you see it from many angles or from only one, it still is something that is then processed within your own consciousness and also within the consciousness of the group you belong to. And that group might be in your filter bubble. We know about Eli Pariser's theory of the filter bubble, that because of the fact that we can customize the way we get our information, we remain within a bubble that is already homogeneous to what we think. We're not exposed to other truths, in other, in other words. And Jan Kotzvetskov, Atlas of Prejudice shows also how easy it is to manipulate the same truth so that it looks like something else. Take the picture. You know, it goes on the video afterwards. I wanted you to take the picture, but I cannot stay too long. Uh, this great collection of cartographic propaganda is at Cornell University. And you see here, there's just a few examples of uh, the way Europe and Asia were depicted in 1904, or what Germany wants, 1917, a really great map that shows the ambitions that were declared by German leaders at that time, or the importance that uh, women voters would have had in 1919 when the suffrage movement was still trying to gain vote rights for women in all the different states of the US, and also the carriers of the new black plague over there the last, uh, the last uh, but not least, uh, you know, I was thinking also of that great New Yorkistan map that, uh, um, that was published by Myra Kalman right after 2001, but that was very different right after 
to the point that then we have um, works like the one by Metahaven, that is a group in the Netherlands, that did this whole movie called The Sprawl, that shows how really the digital uh, invention and digital truth are merged together in almost a seamless sprawl of information that are very hard to uh, distinguish. There's in continuity, um, a complete offer, big offering of exhibitions and art pieces. Just in this moment in New York, we have Unfinished Conversations, that is an exhibition up here at MoMA about artists and protest and artists standing up to reveal truth. We have, of course, the Whitney Biennial, and I'm showing here Open Casket by Dana Schutz, that's become uh, a painting that's at the center of a gigantic controversy that is more about appropriation by white artists of black culture. But still, the whole biennial is about revealing the truth and the importance of artists getting engaged in politics. And then uh, Raymond Pettibon, a pen of all work at the New Museum, and Raymond Pettibon has been documenting the reality of life in New York and in America for a long time. So at any moment, curators and museums are trying to serve you a dose of truth as seen by artists and are trying to do their best to be good citizens. And artists are doing the same. Going back to that uh, discussion about photography, Taryn Simon is one of the most interesting artists today. And in this particular series, the, series, the Innocence, she, uh, she went to uh, people that had been in prison for a long time for crimes that did not commit. And then she kind of reconstructed their story by bringing them on the scene of the crime and injecting a hyper-truth onto the uh, already loaded territory of that particular crime scene. So it really is interesting how by injecting narrative into photography, reality becomes hyper-reality. You might have heard about Ted Hearn, Ted Hearn, the source, which was almost like a play that was all not looping. Okay, stop. Um, that was all about primary sources. So it was about reciting primary sources that were taken by the, the Edward Snowden files that had been released, not to mention Laura Poitras' exhibition at the Whitney last year. In this particular case, these two quite beautiful photographs are actually the recording, the visual recording of intercepted communication. So uh, truth sometimes takes um, a, an aspect that we don't know, especially when it is revealed. Uh, and for instance, in Mona Hatoum's negotiating table, sometimes truth is also too uh, harsh to bear, too hard to bear. This was uh, about the invasion, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in the 1980s. And uh, in this particular case, the performance was really about blood and tears, about the semblance of torture, about trying to render what it must have been to feel that particular invasion and to go through it. Artists also are always trying to speak truth to power. And whether they do it in hindsight, like Marta Minuhin with the Parthenon of Books, or whether they do it live, like Pussy Riot, or whether they do it by representing, like Brett Bailey with Exhibit B, an exhibition that was closed at the Barbican because it was considered too extreme, artists sometimes need to push really hard in order to uh, instigate the truth. And sometimes they push so hard that they also have to bear the consequences for it. But in truth, art can help. And this is a beautiful quote by Saul Bellow that I stole from Brain Pickings, of course. Thank you, Maria. Only art penetrates the seeming realities of this world. There is another reality, the genuine one, which we lose sight of. This other reality is always sending us hints, which, without art, we can't receive. Well, tonight, I hope we will be able to discuss this particular hopeful uh, point by Saul Bello and many others with five great speakers. And I'm going to mention them to you in order of appearance without giving your bio, because you already had it in the email. So we will start with Maria Popova over there, bottom top right, and then Ahmed Shihab al -Din. After him, it'll be Emily, and then Paul Bogosian, and last but not least, Jan Levin. So I would like to uh, tell you all to prepare for a good conversation and a really heated discussion. And Maria, please come to the dice.
So, truth. Um, a useful way to consider what truth means is by devising a kind of taxonomy of the types of truth and realms of truth. In the physical realm, we could say that there are three types of truth that exist in a kind of hierarchy. So in the most widespread, most obvious level, all around us are what we call, what we might call functional truth. So things like the fact that we need electricity in order for light to project the image on the screen. And these functional truths stem from larger truths that come from the nature of reality, which we might call fundamental truths, truths that arise from the fundamental laws of physics, like the fact that light travels at 299,792,458 meters per second to project the images on this screen. And this limit is something that we know that special relativity has shown us is the maximum speed at which any information and matter can travel, and it's inseparable from what we know about space, time, and gravity. And the hope is that one day we might find a model of reality that unifies the two presently incompatible models of quantum field theory and relativity. Here's your old Heisenberg and Einstein up there. Um, and we might call that a final truth or a final theory of truth. Um, some people like the term theory of everything, but um, I find that problematic because it might be that there are things of which we never have a complete theory. So things like consciousness, for instance, because if there's a physical limit to the speed of light, there might well be a fundamental cognitive limit to human consciousness that keeps it from comprehending itself. So, you know, I think any time a system becomes self-referential, it becomes susceptible to paradox. And in logic, the most famous example is the liar's paradox, the liar who says, I am a liar. But uh, we can leave that aside for a moment. The really interesting thing, I think, is that this notion of a final theory bears a somewhat discomforting resemblance to the monotheistic religions with their God's eye view of the universe that offers a single cohesive story that explains all of so-called creation. But while in religion such ultimate explanations are claimed and then asserted and preached, in science, of course, they're theorized and tested so that if and when we do arrive at a final theory, it would be empirically and not dogmatically. But what's more interesting to me is that beneath this common impulse um, that the religious and scientific inquiries into the nature of reality share, there's a larger point, which is the fact that truth operates rather differently in the human realm and in the physical realm. In the human realm, we could say that truth is what we make of and do with physical truth. And in the human realm, we, we hold truth as a kind of moral ideal. These are um, illustrations from a 1969 children's book called How Our Government Helps Us, known today as How Our Government Used to Help Us. Um, so let's say we want to tell the truth. Of course, we first have to know the truth. That is, we have to discover it. So we discover the truth and we tell the truth. Straightforward enough, but of course, it's not that simple because what mediates the truth-telling process is our understanding of the truth. We never really tell the truth. We only ever tell our understanding of the truth. And understanding, and this is where it gets messy, because understanding lives in the realm of meaning. So back to the possible cognitive limits of consciousness, at the very least, we have a definite cognitive bias. We are a storytelling species, and we like reality to come to us in stories that unfold in a sensical way that have meaning. And even on the grandest scale, we expect a kind of cosmic drama that is story-like in which we're cast as actors that have a concrete part to play, that have significance, that have agency and freedom, and most of all, a story in which we matter. And so it becomes quite clear, though, that the more we find out about reality, the more meaningless it becomes, in the sense that, no, we're not at the center of the universe, no, the comets don't come to punish us for our sins, and no, the stars don't exist in the astrological service of our trials and triumphs. So what becomes evident then is that there's a vast lacuna between truth and meaning, and our entire lives are lived out in it. And I think some of the most interesting as well as the most dangerous things in life happen in that lacuna, and it matters whether in it we are swimming or adrift. Now, part of our cognitive bias, of course, is that because the truth is not 
yet known. The tr our knowledge of the truth is incomplete. We have a civilizational track record of filling the gaps of the unknown with imaginings and with, with artificial meaning, let's say. You know, here be monsters. And when the truth is known but inconvenient, well, we then reformulate it and cloak it in illusion and sometimes deliberate deceit, and that is why facts can become insufficient and give rise to alternative facts. But on the other hand, while we may fear that the physical limits of the universe limit our freedom, limit our sense of meaning, in fact, both freedom and meaning arise from how human wisdom interacts with physical truth. Wisdom being the way we take fragmentary bits of information and fact and integrate them into a framework of understanding and then apply that knowledge to how human life is lived. Every great work of art, every Bach symphony, every Dostoevsky novel, every George O'Keefe painting has been created by a, a human being, a constellation of atoms that had to obey the same fundamental laws, that had to operate within the same physical limits and yet managed from within those limits to create something that was rich and meaningful, to take the truth and tell its land and make something transcendent. Virginia Woolf, that great um, cosmic dramatist of human truth, articulated this beautifully in her memoir, Moments of Being, where she talks about the moment in which she had the epiphany that revealed to her what her task as an artist was. And she writes about being in the garden one day and looking at a flower and having this seizure of awareness that the flower is part of the mound of dirt beneath it, which is part of the garden, which is part of the crust of the earth, which is part of the whole earth, all one, so that what she was looking at became, she said, part flower and part earth. And in that moment, she wrote, the cotton wool of ordinary life lifted. And she was able to see that these fragmentary truths about the petals and the flower and the stem and the mound and the garden and the crust and the earth, they all cohere into a unified sense of meaning. And it is the task of the artist to bring that meaning to light. And she wrote, behind the cotton wool is hidden a pattern. The whole world is a work of art. Hamlet or Beethoven quartet is the truth about this vast mass that we call the world. But there is no Shakespeare. There is no Beethoven. Certainly and emphatically, there is no God. We are the words, we are the music, we are the thing itself. Thank you. Does this, oh, very loud, okay. Truth. Well, in the spirit of truth, I'll start by quoting a man who once contracted syphilis in Beirut about 200 years ago. That's Beirut, Lebanon. I have some friends from Lebanon, so I figured a little head nod to them. A sad story, really, but perhaps not as sad as the quote itself. Gustave Flaubert, who pursued the principle of finding le mot juste, or the right word, which, by the way, he considered the key to... Uh, to achieving quality in literary art. And the quote is, there is no truth, there is only perception. Now, as a newsman, that's probably not me delivering any news to anybody in this room, but I'm sure you all are already familiar with the term post-truth or the reality that many people believe we're living in, which is a post-truth reality, where facts don't matter, perceptions do, right? I know you agree. Um, where reality only matters in the context that we are comfortable with or that we're able to create. So what does that mean? Um, where people are, whether knowingly or not, searching and seeking information that only confirms their belief, right? Political, ideological beliefs. You know, a world in which there are countless news sites in my industry, for example, that are dedicated to both profiting and propagating all kinds of fallacies. Now, this social phenomenon is not new, but let's say the one we're witnessing is very much a crisis in conviction on, I think, a very personal level that has to do with compounded kind of circumstances and realities that have unfolded. And judging by the looks on some of your faces, uh, at least uh, this woman here, who's closest to me, um, 
I guess you're all familiar with this, so I'm going to kind of skip ahead, right? Why? Because it's in this digital dystopia that I'm working in, that you're living in, that you're consuming news in, you know, with complete with a daily barrage of tweets that unfortunately I have to sift through more closely than perhaps I would like to. Um, filled with alternative facts, endless opportunities for obfuscation. Uh, you know, we are witnessing this post-truth reality is now trickling from the top down. Uh, not to suggest that it hasn't. I'm doing my best to avoid he who shall not be named. But, um, you know, these unprecedented protests as well that we've been witnessing, that I've had the good fortune and the pleasure to cover, um, it's not just about these buzzwords and these terms that we've been hearing, right? Inter what is it? Intersectional resistance and compounded identity, uh, which I think I've always known. I just didn't know it was called compounded identity. I don't know who came up with that term. But if we interrogate why this is all happening, right, we're going to come to realize that truth isn't really what I'm so concerned about. And I would imagine many of you might feel the same way. Uh, for me, the problem is trust at least um, in my personal and professional life. Uh, that's a common theme these days. But <laughs> I've spent the last few months uh, professionally as a journalist covering this unprecedented wave right, of protests, uh, this intersectional resistance on the political level, but also uh, socially. I think it's also a social revolution to a certain extent. And you know, the one thing I realized is many people uh, feel as though, why is this happening? Well. The lack of trust in terms of institutions, the lack of trust in terms of elected officials, the lack of trust in terms of systems that perhaps previously we might have trusted, um, this is all, I think, very, it creates a lot of anxiety, right? And, you know, I didn't need a slide for this, but I wore it on purpose. Um, this shirt says, in fact, our voice is the only thing that will protect us. And I think this is a real presiding sensation, emotion that's been very palpable for me. Uh, to experience, I think, pertains to this discussion really broadly. Um, and I, I wanted to share one voice with you uh, from my work. Uh, I tweeted, I tweet a lot, for those of you familiar with my work <laughs> or not, uh, you probably sadly may have come across annoying tweets, but never do I get 19,000 retweets. Um, and I think the reason this got 19,000 retweets is because it struck a nerve, uh, which is this abstract truth that I'm trying to describe to you. Uh, so let's just, I don't know how to play it. Do I just hit play? Is that what's true? We have to stay together. Show me I'm what the only way that we can do it. We have to care for each other. And how do you feel today? You know, this is a special day, almost Show historic, but a lot of, lot of passion. You have a lot of pain. I can see the pain on your face. Why do you have pain? Because I was abused when I was 12 years old. When you said what awful thing? Grabbing women things that he, he feels that he can do that to us. I come from a country when I was walking in my city. Men seem that they own me. They seem that they can grab me everywhere. I was awful. And I'm feeling the same thing as 36 years ago. That's horrible. The reason that I want to share that with you is because for me, I can never understand that truth, her truth, her relative truth. Um, as a man, perhaps, you know, what she's describing is hard for me to understand. But it was clear in that moment that she was, she was not, it was almost involuntary, right, her sharing that with me. And I think it's a product of all these things that I was describing, you know. We hear a lot about this deep erosion in trust. Uh, you know, people don't trust the government. People don't trust media. People don't trust banks. Um, and, you know, some people tie it back to the 2007 financial crisis, and they talk about this in, in, you know, kind of economic terms, social terms. But today, for example, fake news, right, something that is, you probably don't want to hear about today, I would imagine, but is, is somehow very relevant. Because for as much as in the media people are talking about this, you know, huge problem we have as if it's a new problem, it's really a symptom, not a problem, right? It's a symptom of a deeper and much more dangerous illness in society. This, this idea that we're so disconnected from each other, we, and this is the collective we, right? We feel misrepresented. The prevailing perception is that we don't know how, how or who to trust. We don't know who to trust or even how to trust anymore. 
Um, and I know I may seem like I'm speaking in generalizations, but the reality is in America, uh, there are fairly large chunks of society, um, maybe even the largest, that believe that everything the mainstream media reports is fake. Whether it's true or not, they do believe that, right? And the only approval rating <laughs> worse than the media's, anybody? Who said Congress? There you go. Uh, so it's Congress, right? Um, and people are now seeking and searching for places to get information. This is big business just before Congress, by the way. So, you know, I, as someone who was profoundly affected uh, five years ago by the Arab uprisings, as someone who is convinced that the decentralization of media is directly dependent upon the, de you know, the democratization of society, um, I, I want to just quickly talk about a phenomenon uh, that many of you are probably familiar with, which is Facebook. Um, you know, when you're on Facebook, what do you do? You see something you don't like, you scroll back, you tap back. If you see something you do like, even before reading it, before finishing it, you do share it with your like-minded social network. Now, I know you know this. You're probably thinking, oh yeah, I know people who do that, but God forbid I don't do that. I read everything. But I don't know if that's actually true. That might just be your perception, right? Facebook is huge, right? It's, it's what, a billion and a half people, 60% of people who get their news from there. And Facebook doesn't care about engagement. Facebook doesn't care about the truth. Facebook just wants to engage you. They want you to stay there. And sadly, bullshit is engaging. Um, so don't get me wrong. I mean, w you know, if you've seen any of my work, as I, as I mentioned earlier, chances are you've seen it on Facebook. Uh, you know, people think my work itself is fake news, regardless of the company I work for. And very quickly, this is just a quick visualization of the clickbait model, right? This is the monetization model for news. I learned it at HuffPost. Here's the quick 101 crash course. One, find something people are talking about. Two, come up with an outrageous headline that will grab them. And three, just put it in front of them and it will spread. Now last year, MIT published this. This is a study that found that social networks help conspiracy theories grow. They found that in the online ecosystem, all that really matters is whether information fits your narrative. It doesn't matter necessarily what the information is. And so at a time when we have an administration that claims to have their own set of alternative facts, um, the bad news is that you know, when people are seeking the truth, facts help. But that's actually not happening because facts, at least in my estimation, rarely stand on their own. You need to care about the facts. And chances are, if you think about even some of the most fundamental facts you know, there was someone at some point who made you care about that. Now, because uh, I'm a little bit short on time, I was going to speak about how I moved from Egypt, where I spent 10 years, and then moved to Vienna, Egypt being very brown and chaotic. And forgive me for racializing these places, but I feel like it's part and parcel with the times we live in. Austria was very white and orderly by comparison. And so for me, the truths about the way I was living in Egypt and what dictated my possibilities and opportunities and the realities of my life were completely contradicted by the reality of life in Austria. And I was 14 trying to make sense of this thinking, but this was true there, how is it not true here? So, aha, the truth is relative. So the last uh, point I want to make before I wrap with you is something that's kind of haunted me throughout my career as someone who started at Columbia University where as a 24-year-old wide-eyed student, I didn't understand what they were trying to drill in my head, which is this idea of objectivity. Uh, and something that I think uh, leads to the crisis in confidence and trust in media and in truth today and makes it so hard to, to get to the truth. Uh, because I believe as a journalist, and this has kind of been a guiding force in my career, transparency, um, accountability, is more important than aspiring to objectivity. I, I think uh, the first speaker, you said, Maria, that um, we, uh, we, we share our understanding of the truth rather than the truth itself, or, you know, everything is, is relative to that. And before I wrap, I want to share a, a question that was on the sheet that I tried to address. You know, I was looking through all the questions we had discussed on our call, and I thought, there's so much to say about the truth. What can I really share with them? And I realized there's a question about fiction. As a journalist, we don't often focus on fiction, right? We focus on facts, or at least in theory, that's what we're supposed to be doing. But the question was, how can fiction help you know, in getting to the truth? And it's only recently in my career that I've started to think about this because I'm so disillusioned, <laughs> especially in the last two years with the way you know, things are kind of going, that I realized, yeah, maybe there is power in fiction, even maybe more power. Maybe fiction can get to the truth even more than um, facts. And so 
Um, not to kind of shout myself out, but let me just skip ahead here. How can fiction help? Well, I recently had an opportunity from a young filmmaker who's Saudi Arabian, who's a fan of my work, to act in a short film that he had done in LA. And I thought, well, I'm not an actor, although it would be a much nicer life than perhaps a journalist. And I said, you know what, I'll do it. I went there for three days. And this is a story about the Deir Yassin massacre, which very few people might uh, know about here. But in the Middle East and in Palestine in particular, which is where I'm originally from, it's uh, one of those truths, if you will, that has been forgotten. And so it was an opportunity to play a reporter who is Palestinian American, who gets there, who witnesses the Deir Yassin massacre, meets a woman who was raped, and goes to his editor to say, listen, this is a human story, it's powerful, it's better than going to the battlefield and just giving the numbers of the atrocities. And of course, the editor says, no, who cares about that? Our readers don't care about that. Now that spoke directly to my truth in the past 10 years, a truth that I, on a personal level, have struggled with. And quite frankly, don't often speak about because it doesn't often serve my interests when I bring this up. But anyway, I wanted to just quickly share this with you as, as a wrap and then let's see if... This is a quick trailer. I am proud to admit that this speaks to my truth. I am proud that my truths and my perceptions influence my reporting. And I can only say, and I say this with humility, that I think out of all the things that I think is, is lacking from the media, I wish there was a more concerted effort uh, to be more open about our own truth and what that actually means. Uh, because I think the quality of reporting would, would go up and perhaps there'd be more trust in the truth. So thank you very much. I'm going to actually start here. So thank you all for coming. I spent the past, I spent over 10 years interviewing activists and dissidents in the authoritarian world. And these were countries where the mass media was often controlled by the state and where opposition voices tended to be silenced. And in countries like these, if you wanted to go look for the truth, sometimes your best bet was the internet. Now, I realize in today's America, that sounds actually crazy. <laughs> the idea that, you know, right now we're talking about social media's power to distort reality, if not spread outright lies. And here I'm talking about countries where social media actually was spreading the truth. And so I want to give just a few quick examples of how that works. This is a quote, this is a quote from, use this, this is a quote from China. Is this one? Hello. Oh, this is a quote from China, and this is Michael Anti, an internet activist. And before becoming a dissident, he was actually a strong supporter of the Chinese Communist Party. And it was only when he first went online that he learned that the official version of history that he had heard all his life was not the same history that the rest of the world knew. So this quote from him says, before going online, for 20 years I lived in 1984. I absolutely didn't know what really happened in the world. I only knew what they wanted me to know. He's referring there to the Tiananmen Square crackdown of 1989 and the difference in the version that he saw online and what he had learned from the media. This is, um, uh, this is a blogger from Cuba. Her name is Luisa. Her story is a little bit different. Michael Anti went online in order to find the truth. She went on the internet in order to tell the truth. So she felt that you know, Cuba's media, which was controlled by the state, was not reflecting the realities that she saw every day. So she started a blog basically just to tell the stories of the Cubans that she saw around her. This is kind of a longish quote, but this is just about talking about how it's about communicating the anxieties that plague Roberto, a young man who does not work for the state but spends his days sitting on a park bench, why there is so much delinquency and alcoholism. This is a reality that the official media tries to conquer because they are forbidden to explain why. This was her way to tell her personal truth. This is Alexei Navalny. 
very well, a lot of people are talking about him today because he was just arrested this weekend as protest swept Russia. And Alexei Navalny is Russia's most prominent opposition figure and is also an anti-corruption blogger. And for years, he built his following by going on the internet and exposing corruption. So here you have three examples. Someone going on the internet to find the truth, someone going on the internet to tell the truth, and someone going on the internet to expose the truth. How does this relate to the US? So you know, I, I've always said, oh yeah, I, I don't really do the US, I do, I do authoritarian countries. Well, it turns out that this is becoming more relevant to the United States. As you can see from this Gallup poll, America's trust in the, Americans' trust in the media has sunk to an all-time low. So what does this mean? Are we now in a world where social media is where we're going to find the truth? So interestingly, over the past couple years, I've been working with a professor at NYU, Charlton McElwain, and we've been interviewing Black Lives Matter activists all over the country. And I was really startled to hear how similar some of them sounded to the people that I interviewed for my book. So this is an example just from one activist. We started to use Twitter and Facebook and Instagram as a way to just get the word out, to contrast the stark mainstream media blackout. Social media has given people on the ground a voice and a validation as a trusted source. So if you talk to Black Lives Matter activists, what some of them will say is that in the past, the media generally relied on the official police narrative, but social media has given them an opportunity to tell their own side of the story. Okay, so here you have some examples of social media being pivotal in spreading the truth. The problem is, as Ahmed mentioned, we are in a bit of a crisis period in the United States. First one is the fake news problem, right? These are just, this, these are just five of the top political news, fake political news stories on Facebook. The problem is, is that often these fake news stories gain more traction than real stories. Then we have another problem, which Paola mentioned earlier, which is the filter bu bubble problem. This is the Wall Street Journal does this very interesting thing where they, it's called blue feed, red feed, and they kind of, it's, it's not real, they just sort of concoct what the different feeds would look like if you were liberal or conservative. So you're actually not going to see the same reality. So, you know, this is an example of immigration. The liberal side is going, liberal, Facebook users are going to see, you know, something from Bernie Sanders, basically talk, you know, telling Trump to stop pick on, stop picking on the undocumented. Whereas the conservatives will see something about, you know, a tragic story of rape committed by illegal immigrants. So two completely different versions of reality, vis-a-vis -vis the same issue. So now here's where Ahmed and I are going to sort of merge. Um, this is a this is a quote by Mario Vargas Llosa. And this is about, Akuma talked a little bit about the power of film. This is about the power of literature in countries like this. So let me just preface this by saying, I still do believe in the power of social media. I think social media can play a very important function in exposing the truth. However, I think there are other places to find the truth as well. And if we are at a moment in time where Americans are losing faith in facts, then maybe it's time to turn to stories. And this quote, which I really like, if you live in a country where there is nothing comparable to free information, often literature becomes the only way to be more or less informed about what is going on. Now, I think this quote refers more to societies that are undergoing censorship, that's, or you know, authoritarian countries, which I do not think the United States is at this moment. Um, but I think you know, we are facing a post-truth crisis, and we are already seeing Americans turning to fiction in order to better understand it. These three books, right? These three books, thankfully, are not very factual. However, they have recently returned to the bestsellers list. These are three dystopian novels, Brave New World, 1984, It Can't Happen Here, and all of which are gaining renewed popularity. And I think that's really a sign of people, again, turning to stories in, uh, in order to understand the current political moment. I just want to give this example. This is just one example of a book I recently read. This is, this is a young adult novel. Recently has been number one, a New York Times young adult bestseller. And you know, some people are talking about it as the Black Lives Matter novel. And I just think this is a very good example of a very, very compelling story. You know, I've read a lot about, I read a lot about activism movements all over the world. I think this story 
because it you know brings you into it's basically about a young woman whose friend is killed by a cop. This happens right in the right in the beginning of the the novel, and then kind of all the different dynamics that play out surrounding that, and it presents like a very complex, very nuanced picture of this the current racial tensions in the United States. And I think that one could argue that a novel like this might actually be more illuminating about this topic than the countless news articles that are written about it. And finally, why? Because it's another quote. Sorry, Paula, a lot of quotes here. <laughs> um, this is by Khaled Hosseini, who, um, author of The Kite Runner and other books. I interviewed him years ago. Um, and I think this just kind of sums it up really well. And as Maria said, we are a storytelling species. And I think we just understand the world through stories. And people connect a lot with things that are radically different from their own lives through fiction. You can read a lot about a certain country, a certain culture, but fiction lifts you out of your chair and gives you an immediate access, immediate pass into that world. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, is this my one? So, um, I, uh, I got this uh, email late at night from Paola saying that there was going to be the Salon on Truth, and I, I said, you don't have a philosopher on the panel. And uh, how could you talk about truth and the relation between truth and reality without having a philosopher? Well, maybe there is an answer to that, which, because uh, philosophers, I think, think about these issues in very, very different ways <laughs> from some of the things that... Um, I've heard some of my co-panelists say. Um, you see, I th let's just take an ex a, a claim, like there are exactly 97 people in this room. If you look at that claim, or belief, this claim can be true or false. Okay? Um, and the truth is settled by the number of people that there are in this room. We may not know what the answer is, we may not know whether it's exactly 97 people, but one thing you know for sure, there is a fact of the matter as to whether the claim is true or false, and that fact of the matter is settled by how many people are in the room. So one thing that it would not make a lot of sense intuitively is to think there is my truth about this and then there is your truth about this. Okay. Um, so when people reacted with horror at Kellyanne Conway saying that, you know, some people thought there were more people at Trump's inauguration than there were at Obama's, and other people thought there were more at Obama's than there were at Trump's, and you know, these are alternative facts. Okay, that notion makes absolutely no sense. There is no such thing as my truth and your truth about how many people are in this room, there is one truth, and we can establish it, in this case quite easily by counting, okay? But the, the, there isn't such a thing as perspectival truth when it comes to claims like that. In fact, I would argue that the notion of a perspectival truth or a relative truth makes absolutely no sense in any interesting case. Um, but yet, you see, we're all up in arms about the alt-right invoking the notion of alt-facts, and yet many of the people who spoke prior to me were very comfortable with the idea of my truth versus your truth, or many kinds of truths, uh, and so on. Um, in fact, before uh, the notion of alternative facts, alternative truths, alternative realities became popular with the alt-right, they were very popular with the mainstream left. Uh, and I say this as somebody who is very sympathetic to leftist ideals. But if you have been in a university and have taken a course in the humanities or social sciences, over the past 20 or 30 years, what you were probably taught is precisely that there is 
great reason to be suspicious of the notion of the truth or the objective truth. Rather, there are truths for different communities or di truths for different people, perspectival truths. Um, and of course, once this is taught in universities for so many years, you're bound to find that it's going to seep into the wider culture, in particular into politics. Now, why is it that the notion of relative truth, of suspicion of the objective truth, um, became so popular with the left? Well, there were some good motivations. One motivation was moral and political, and that is that the notion of objective truth had often been abused, okay? Uh, if you know the history of colonialism, you know that colonial projects were often justified on the ground that the stronger power had greater access to the objective truth, and so could oppress um, weaker uh, groups by claiming that they simply didn't know what the colonizer knew. Um, the other is a more of a theoretical motivation, and there are, there have been prominent philosophers who have raised issues about the validity of the notion of objective truth, most recently the famous American pragmatist Richard Rorty. Now, as far as the political motivation goes, it's a very unsound one, because even if you can protect the views of oppressed minorities by saying, don't invoke this notion of the objective truth. There is your truth and there is my truth, and you can't impose yours on mine. There is a much better way to do that, which is to say it doesn't matter if somebody has better access to what is objectively true. It's still morally impermissible to ram that down somebody else's throat, uh, no matter what they uh, think of it. Um, so there is a moral way of blocking the abuse of a good concept. You don't have to throw out the good concept in order to do that. And theoretically, um, the motivations that people had um, were that, you know, it seemed as though if you were committed to the objective truth, you were committed to there being only one correct way of describing reality. But that is, of course, not an implication of the idea of objective truth at all. There can be more than one correct description of reality, absolutely. Just, you know, there can be, it can be true that there is, um, there are 97 people in this room, and it can also be true that among the 97 people in this room are three philosophers, and four of them are from, uh, four of the people from, in this room are from uh, Indiana. There are many, many different correct descriptions. What objective truth doesn't allow you to say is that two descriptions that are mutually incompatible with one another can be equally correct, as, for example, in the alt facts about the size of Trump's crowd. So, um, and furthermore, you know, one of the things that people worry about with the notion of the truth is who's to say what's true? After all, as some people have said, we process the truth in different ways. Uh, now, doesn't that mean that there isn't such a thing as the truth after all? The answer is no. You may count the number of people in this room and get one result. I may count and get another result. This is a conflict in uh, views about how many people are in this room. Um, and if there is such a disagreement, then we're going to have to do the count over again. We know what methods we need to use in order to settle that question. And even if it's unsettleable, as may be the case in certain cases, that doesn't mean that there wasn't a truth of the matter to begin with. Um, and so I don't think, you know, if you really want to be, um, if you, if, you, if you take umbrage at this use of the notion of alternative facts, it can only be because you actually believe that there is such a thing as the truth. Thank you.
try to use the handheld um, mic. Um, this image I'm starting with of the universe is not one that we can actually see. This is a picture of our galaxy that's collected from real data, collected by light. Very nearly everything we know about the universe comes to us from light. We see the galaxy not from the outside, but from within. This is closer to the perspective of our Milky Way from the third rock um, from the sun, which is where we're bound, collecting information about the universe. I remember when I was um, uh, very young looking out my window in Chicago at this universe, my view of the universe was very unspectacular in comparison, you know, just a few urban flecks. And I remember wanting to know what else was out there. And I remember learning that the Earth is round. And I thought we lived inside the sphere. And I was really amazed by this. This was my first failed cosmology, but unfortunately not my last failed theory, but it was my first failed theory. I thought we lived inside the Earth, and I was so astounded. I could almost imagine the eggshell of the sky from where I, I was looking. And I remember when I learned that actually, yes, the Earth is round, but we live on the surface of the sphere. I was not only so amazed by this glorious picture that we now have from this composite image of sort of floating in the space, but I was amazed that I could be wrong in this wonderful shared way uh, of, of the truth being, being true for all of us. And I remember being so affected by being wrong in that way and delighted by being wrong in that way. And so what I sort of want to talk about um, tonight is how important wrong ideas are, not only to truth, but especially in the context of science and, um, and the pursuit of scientific discoveries. Um, we all... Um, have our different uh, prejudices about science, but I, I want to emphasize that I also thought around the same time in my life, actually, that all physicists, I'm now a physicist, all physicists just memorized facts and simply recited you know, a list of, of facts that they knew. And I thought there was nothing less creative or interesting or imaginative than being a physicist. If you had told me I was going to be a physicist, I would have been deeply offended. And you know, now I understand that, that science obviously is not the pursuit of the recital of facts, although it is the pursuit of truth. And it's the pursuit of the discovery of truth. Let's be honest, we do these things because we love it. We love the process of discovery and discovering truths that are true for all of us, not just for me. And it's that process of discovery that's so exciting in science. And to never be wrong means you're simply not, you're not being a real scientist. And, and not only must you be wrong sometimes in the pursuit of truth, but sometimes the wrong ideas have pushed the true ideas further than anything else. Um, I want to talk now about Einstein, because I always talk about Einstein, and it's kind of a glitch of mine. In my, in my, um, when I grow up, I'm going like, to become a geneticist, I think. But in the interim, I talk about Einstein. Now, Einstein, 100 years ago, theorizes that space-time is curved. I can't do all of general relativity in less than seven minutes. But immediately after, he writes down his grandest achievement, the general theory of relativity. He thinks, look, if things like the sun curve space and time around them, then when the sun moves, or let's say two suns orbit each other, they must create waves in the shape of space time. After all, those curves have to follow the sun. And as was mentioned, um, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, including the information about where our sun is or where our moon is or where our earth is. So if the sun moves, or the Earth moves, or for that matter, if I move, the curves I create in space-time must move around me, creating waves, gravitational waves. He was not thinking about black holes. He was not thinking about the Big Bang. He was not thinking about the expansion of the universe. He didn't believe any of those things were true, even though at least one of those things, namely the existence of black holes, had been pointed out to him. He didn't think they were real. He thought the most important thing to turn your attention to was this idea of these gravitational waves. Now, he writes a paper in 1916 saying gravitational waves exist. He writes a paper a year later saying that they don't exist. A couple years later, he writes a paper saying, again, that they don't exist. And without his collaborator's knowledge between acceptance and actually submitting the manuscript to press, he changes the paper entirely saying they do exist. Somebody says, you know, Einstein, your famous name is going to be on these papers. You have to be very careful. And Einstein says, you know, my name is on plenty of wrong papers. You know, you don't have to be so concerned about this. And I think that's a really interesting thing to say. We live in a time um, uh, where being uh, uh, wrong is some kind of anathema. 
And nobody can just in good faith say, of course I was wrong because I'm in pursuit of something so great, I couldn't possibly just recite the facts from my head. I have to discover them. Okay, so they're still struggling with the existence of gravitational waves. And here comes Joe Weber. It's the late 1960s. And still by 1960, there's no concrete evidence or definitive evidence that black holes exist. There's certainly no definitive evidence that gravitational waves exist. People are still arguing about the existence of these things. Here comes Joe Weber, who's this lone, brazen pioneer, and he decides, oh, these theorists are wasting their time with calculations and arguing. I'm simply going to go outside and have a look around. If gravitational waves are real, I'm going to discover them. He makes an instrument now known as a Weber bar. It's kind of like a tuning fork. If space-time waves around starts to oscillate around this Weber bar. Now, now realize these waves come from unknown sources. He hasn't even tried to uh, conjecture what they are. They, they could come from very far away across the universe, but once they, they slosh over the Earth, they will ring the bar like a tuning fork. Wildly exaggerated, but that's the idea. Joe Weber spends about 10 years nearly single-handedly designing the Weber bar and um, and his bar begins to ring daily in response to sources, sources from the center of our own galaxy, that image that we just saw. He goes to a general relativity conference where the very existence of gravitational waves were still under debate, and he presents his findings that he has discovered gravitational waves. It is the discovery of the century. Einstein didn't even know if they were real, and he has detected them. So he becomes the most famous scientist of the time. He's on the cover of magazines. He's heralded, he's applauded, he's celebrated. Pretty soon there are Weber bars all over the world. They're in Japan, in Moscow, they're in Italy, they're in Scotland. Um, there's, they're, they even put one of Joe's instruments on the moon. <laughs> Not the Weber bar, but one of his instruments goes to the moon. They're literally everywhere. And after about two years of solid campaigning by all of these independent groups, it's dead quiet out there. Not a signal, not a sound, not a detection from anybody, but from Joe. Joe becomes completely maligned. He becomes um, a, a sort of uh, completely marginalized figure and um, kind of uh, a, a figure not only to be scorned, but, but, but the world becomes cruel. They want to expose him. It's like they, they, they kind of hunt him down. They tease him with false discoveries only to expose him publicly as a fraud. Um, now, I don't believe that Joe was a fraud. I believe that he was making a, an honest um, error in his statistical analysis. But Joe Weber pursues his work for 25, 30 more years, um, despite all of the counterclaims and all the evidence against him. Let's fast forward to 2000. Um, in the year 2000, this competing instrument is built called LIGO. This is also the same year that Joe dies. Um, LIGO is an instrument that was inspired by Joe's wrong work. It came around in the early 1970s, 50 years ago. Okay. Early 1970s, they dreamt of an instrument, not this little Weber bar that cost $15,000. Unfortunately, it cost a billion dollars. About 1,000 people, an entire international team of scientists. I won't describe to you how LIGO works, but these are four kilometer long instruments. They're, they're like L-shaped, they span four kilometers. There's two instruments on two different coasts massive experimental endeavor. And, um, and LIGO is only constructed after 30 years. Uh, again, in the year 2000, it's a first generation of instruments. Now, some people who have heard of LIGO might think, oh, this instrument just turned on, and it discovered these gravitational waves. Let me tell you, LIGO did not succeed in the year 2000, and by the year 2015, it still hadn't succeeded. The first generation of, of LIGO instruments heard nothing. Okay. LIGO was struggling not only under the black mark of Weber's um, false claims, even if they were innocently uh, uh, claimed, um, but also under the severe opposition of, of great scientists and colleagues who thought, what are you doing? This was already shown to be uh, the wrong direction to go in. This was already a killed project. I cannot believe not only are you resurrecting this, but at the tune of a billion dollars. So LIGO struggled under its, uh, its own problems for quite a while after Joe. Um, this is just a, a picture of some of the scientists installing one of the um, components in the machine. So it comes to the year 2015. The new generation of instruments has been installed. What you just saw was a bunch of scientists uh, 
installing the new components of the advanced machine. So what happened is they had to take this huge machine and gut it, take everything out, because it wasn't, it was working beautifully. But gravitational waves are so quiet, so delicate, that it still recorded nothing. So they installed these very sophisticated advanced components. And this is the last real shot that they have, because if this doesn't succeed, not even the National Science Foundation is going to continue to fund them. So here it's 2015. It's 100 years, the centenary of Einstein's general theory of relativity. The scientists have just finished installing the advanced components. It's the middle of the night on September 14th. And they're supposed to start their science runs, but they're not ready. The, they're, they're behind schedule, they're not quite completely ready, they decide to postpone their science runs, they're working in the middle of the night, and on both sites, one in Louisiana, one in Washington State, they put down their tools, exhausted, they decide to go home. Uh, within the span of an hour, a signal sloshes over the Earth. What happened was that a billion years ago, two black holes, in the final moments of their long life together, orbited about four final times, emitting enough gravitational waves, a lot of power in gravitational waves in those final moments, to send it out through the universe. Somewhere in the southern sky this happened. The two black holes, this is drastically slowed down. The two black holes collided and merged and formed one bigger black hole and then went quiet. Uh, yes, it's quite crazy. Let me tell you, <laughs> sorry, I was, I was lost in my own reverie for a second. Um, Every once in a while that happens to me. Uh, the power that came out of that collision was uh, greater than the power of all the stars shining in the observable universe combined. And none of it came out as light, none of it. All of that power came out in this ringing of space-time itself. That event was caught by the LIGO machines, perfectly recorded in the absence of the instrumentalists on site. And all that was recorded was one-fifth of a second. One-fifth of a second. And when the machine rang, it rang by less than the width, oh, it's actually one ten-thousandth the width of a proton, over the four-kilometer span of the instruments. Okay. So this discovery became a huge announcement. And um, what I really want to conclude with here is, obviously, papers were written, press releases were announced, many, many prizes have been awarded to the um, original founders of LIGO. And they all will cite, both in the discovery paper and in their acceptance speeches, Joe Weber. Thank you. to be there because your mic goes there, yes. I go here, and everybody else can sit wherever you want. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, so you keep this because you're the one that doesn't have it, and you go there. Well, thank you very much for these great, great, great contributions. So Jana, where was the truth in all that? There was a lot of stubbornness. Yeah. And so well, what was I the think, truth? Well, so I think, um, what we get from that is exactly the lack of relativism in the truth there, because as much as Joe wanted the narrative to be true, you know, Joe was also um, one of the discoverers of the maser, the laser, mm -hmm. originally under a different name, maser, and he missed out on that discovery as well. He missed out on the Nobel Prize, on the money, on the acclaim, and there was, there was one other occasion. Um, Joe was very close to proposing uh, the, the experiment to detect the light left over from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background. And so I think in this case, he just, the, it, the loss was too great mm -hmm. to give up on this. And I don't think um, that even if that's what the narrative he preferred, that all the world watching could possibly confirm it for him as much as he wanted it to be true. And that's, mm -hmm. that's you know, the impact of having to not only admit that you're wrong, but be rewarded by the knowledge that the truth is universal. Mm -hmm. It's true for everybody. Mm -hmm. But nobody could say, I mean, there were not, it, it was not like there were 96 people in the room. That was something that was an intuition of truth. Huh? Exactly? exactly. <laughs> what did you say? I said 97. Said 97. 97. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it's really fascinating. So do you have questions for each other? What did you all think about what Paul said? 
What? Well, obviously, Paul set, set it up, so I didn't. I could just brazenly go ahead with the truth because thank you great. for <laughs> yes for validating that but, perspective, and then I charged ahead. One, by the way, one I, I would have thought one thing you would say in response to is that um, you know it showed that there was such a thing as vindicating the truth. Wait, because the audiovisual uh, guys are going to be mad at me because I asked for the lavalier. So. Maybe I should get rid of it. Okay. Keep it with your hands like that. Yeah. Use it as if it were a normal microphone. Yeah. This, this is not a very good image, but okay. Um, it, 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 the theory predicts something, and for a long time the confirmation of that prediction is not there, and then suddenly the prediction comes in. That's the, that's the vindication of the truth. It's been well, also, I mean, Einstein didn't believe that black holes existed for good reason. I mean, those were really good reasons. Yeah. It was completely logical and sensible to think nature's never going to find a way to crush matter that severely. He thought the mathematical description was perfectly valid. He was very impressed with it mathematically. There was no doubt about that. But would nature find a way to do this? It's completely reasonable to conjecture, no. And, um, and yet, here we are in a time where we hear black holes collide even when we can't see them. Well, I think it's interesting to differentiate between the kinds of errors that um, erode truth versus the kinds of errors that self-propagate and advance truth because oftentimes we call an error something that is in conflict with the status quo and with the established order when it, in fact it can be a challenge that grows it and Weber didn't have much to go on either way to, to, but what we call errors I guess is inevitably how ideas propagate to begin with and to advance to a new level. Um, but what is the point at which, I mean, what would have, what should have happened in order for him to quit? Well, I mean, there's this painful letter that Freeman Dyson, the famous um, scientist uh, Freeman Dyson writes to Joe, because he really encouraged Joe and he was really excited about his project. And he writes him this painful letter essentially saying you're a great man and a great man can admit when he's wrong. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the letter goes ignored, but it's, it's really hard to read. So um, I wanted to ask Ahmed something about, the, uh, about what Emily was discussing. You know, the digital can be used in many different ways. It can be used for transparency. It can be used to reveal the truth. It can be used to speak the truth. So in your... Uh, you're almost like a digital native as a journalist, right? Yes, more or so less. Yeah. You, so how have you seen life in journalism without paper? Um, and uh, how connected is it to the ground and to the truth? It's a great question. And it's, it's one that I've spent 10 years answering and don't know the answer to. But mm -hmm. um, I prefaced it with that because like any new technology, like any new invention, like any new thing that we use, and... I, it's hard saying this sitting next to a philosopher trying to sound like I'm philosophizing, but what I think you find, perhaps, I could imagine, one would think. Uh, uh, no, but, you know, it's, it's that um, you don't necessarily see the full extent or the full possibilities in which you can use it. So when social media first came around, when blogs first came around, there's kind of been this hurrah, this championing of decentralization of information. And, Back 10 years ago when I graduated from Columbia, I went to a lot of, you know, I was working at the New York Times, a whole bunch of places. Part of the reason I was hired a lot of places was because, oh, that guy's the native guy, the digital guy, he gets it. Um, of course, uh, whether I did or not isn't the point. The point is, I think a lot of people were excited by these ideas of engagement and interactivity and live. And here we are, Facebook Live, you know, we're living in a different time, obviously. And all of those, I think, have led to these protracted problems we have when it comes to trust and, and truth. That said, um, there was a very particular part of my career, and I hate to be so self-referential, but the reason I am is because there was a time when I really believed, you know, I was kind of more, what would a philosopher say, more naive, perhaps? I don't know, I was more... That's what a philosopher would say? Never. Yeah, That's naive. judgment. <laughs> See, clearly I don't know what I'm doing, but, you know, uh, I was more naive in thinking that um, it's a force for good, you know, this connectivity, uh, because as a reporter who was based here, I would, you know, travel to the Middle East and... Twitter at the very beginning was like a Rolodex for me. I was intimately familiar with what was happening in a very specific neighborhood in Turkey and Nigeria and places I had gone and also people who I had met at conferences and shared real true moments with. And the reason I, I say all these anecdotes is because that to me was kind of what stood out and made me perhaps stand out 
um, in terms of my abilities to quickly confirm within a margin of error. Now I'm, I'm scared. I'm going to turn this out. I did it to myself. <laughs> but within a margin of error, you know, I, I felt like I had access to people in, in journalism and media and storytelling, access it, and, and it develops credibility, as you know, um, especially in this day and age when there's so much information out there. So for me, what it's been like is um, it's been a wave of being inspired by possibility, and now in the last two years, as we talked about, a uh, little bit disillusioned by you know, the fact that in reality, the bottom line isn't truth or even impact or the things that motivate me as a storyteller, which is shifting perceptions. It's often money and clicks. You, you said that you were a bit in a crisis. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's very interesting. I guess there's a lot of depth, of personal depth to thinking about truth. And uh, um, Emily and I had this brunch at the Odeon, I want to be precise, you know, just uh, a few months ago. And uh, I had already been thinking about a song about truth. But then during my uh, brunch with Emily, it became about fiction and truth. And for some reason, I always thought fact and truth, not fiction and truth, because I don't read that much fiction. And you said instead you want to start writing a novel, which is something that Jana already also did. You know, as a scientist, you also decided you wanted to write a novel. So um, can you tell me more about, did you decide to write a novel because you wanted to move into a new phase of your truth seeking? Or? Oh, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> oh, that's a tough question. Well, I think that I've always believed in the power of fiction to tell the truth. I've always thought that. And it's almost more like I was working up to write a novel. I actually think novels can be a better way of telling the truth than nonfiction. I think it depends on the kind of reader that you are. But I remember when I was in college, I took a comparative literature class and it was about the conflict in the Middle East. And I was just a freshman in college. I didn't really have a strong opinion about it either way. I just, you know, was coming into it actually as a fairly blank slate. And, you know, that particular conflict, as, as we all know, is one in which there really is not a shared conception of reality. It's a very, like, depends on who you ask, you know, according to, like, did this happen? Did this happen when? Who started it? It's like, you know, so if you look at even timelines and basic facts, there's really, like, it's very hard to get a sense of that reality. And um, it was only, and so the, the, the class was just reading books, reading fiction, you know, from both sides, from Israelis, from Palestinians, from other, you know, other parties. And, I felt like in doing that, I actually, by kind of getting immersed in the stories, you, I felt that I got a much better idea of where both sides was coming from. I can't, can't say like who was right or who was wrong, but you just, I understood it at a much deeper level. And I feel like America right now is kind of entering that phase where we also do not have a shared history. There was an interesting article, I think it was in Vox, where somebody was saying that, you know, in the future, we're not even going to have a shared sense of history because right now you look at 2016 you look at 2017 like there is not even agreement on like how many people were at that inauguration <laughs> you know so so yeah. i think like and, and my book is in my, my i'm working on a novel that is set in america and is very much about politics and government it's very fictional but for me i think it's a it's a more effective vehicle for understanding what's happening in uh, i just wanted to quickly to add as you were speaking i couldn't help but think of semantics and words and word choice and why it's so important and i, I don't mean what you're saying but based on the two comments you guys mentioned you saying that the speakers before you were very comfortable talking about my truth and then you now saying that fiction you found is maybe even more powerful at, at telling the truth but then i thought well and i'm Again, forgive me, I mean, it's contagious and all of a sudden realizing I'm pseudo-philosophizing. But maybe it's so important because when she said that, I was like, but when you say truth, it's like also for me in reporting, it's like, what does truth mean? Because you're not, I wouldn't imagine you would believe empirically, and nor would I, even though I think we share this sentiment being as disillusioned as we are, that it, you know, fiction can point to specific absolute truths or truths that are somehow easy to synthesize and understand because to me when I tell a story like that woman or when I acted in this film it's telling a broader truth that's going to be extremely relatively interpreted so then I wonder maybe fiction tells the truth 
on a macro level or on a relative level as opposed to yeah, nonfiction maybe, being specific? Yeah, maybe truth is, it's true that even though this is a salon about truth, I feel like, you know, <laughs> maybe that's not even the, the best word for what fiction does. I mean, maybe it's just a sense of empathy, you know, and, and, and it's, you know, and the, the novel that I, I mentioned in, in my presentation, presentation, The Hate You Give, which is like the Black Lives Matter novel, I think that that is a good example of that because I think there's definitely people who, you know, I, I think we also have, we have a crisis of, of narration in this country, right? I mean, it's, it's people are, are, don't trust the narrators. They don't trust the media to narrate. And I think sometimes, you know, novels, I mean, obviously novels can be politically biased and they can have an agenda for sure, but sometimes you might be able to enter a novel with a more open mind and be willing to be more empathetic in a way that you wouldn't when, you know, you open a newspaper because right now, again, depending on who you ask, like this newspaper's too liberal, this newspaper's too conservative, people think that the media has an agenda. Maria, you wanted to say something? Well, to all of that, um, I think one thing we kind of know intellectually but emotionally systematically put aside is the fact that our models of truth are invariably maps. And maps are not reality, maps are representations of reality. So take, for example, a person and, and your model of the truth about a person is a map onto which, as you get to know them, you plot their likes and dislikes, their values, their vulnerabilities. It's your own map or it's, it's your, an objective map? Well, the way you model the truth about that person, you make your own you map. make a map based on every interaction, you fill it in, and the measure of how well you know that person is how well you're able to navigate the landscape of their personhood and of the relationship using your map. So, each time it's tested against reality in every interaction. Mm -hmm. and let's but say there is a truth. You have a there map is a truth, but you're truth. mapping it. And, and yeah. that's how we understand, that's how we plot all of our understanding of truth. So if, if there's somebody you say, is some, okay, I know this person really well, I mm -hmm. trust my map is accurate, right? And then you encounter a piece of information that is radically incompatible, so much so that it asks you to redraw the map in such a way that you replace a mountain with a valley. So then the interesting thing that happens when we, every time we go through one of these, we have to go through a decision tree in which we evaluate, is this information likely to be correct or incorrect? Is this information relevant or irrelevant? How many layers of understanding and interpretation have taken place between the source that gives me the information and what I'm understanding of the source giving me? And finally, we decide, are we going to incorporate that into the map, so revise the map, or discard it as irrelevant? But I think the most important thing that happens is that it almost doesn't matter what you end up doing with that new information, because in that computation, what's happened is that you've been shocked into remembering that your model of the truth about the person has been a map all along, and maybe inadvertently you've constructed it with the same here be monsters mentality. Well, I, I wish the people were so aware. Yeah. But we, but we become aware every time our models are mm -mm. confronted with reality. And, and that can be a very deeply discomforting and yeah. awareness that causes great suffering because we crave completeness so intensely. And every time we're reminded of the incompleteness of our models, we suffer. Oh, that's the, the, the round. Well, I don't know how to say it in English, but Parmenide. Um, <laughs> What do you say to this, Paul? <laughs> you know, you know this. Um, yes. Which bit? Yeah. Let's see. Um, look, the um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that um, all of our representations of the world are maps. Uh, maps are very particular kinds of representation, and uh, some of, some some of our representations are maps. But many of our beliefs are not maps. They're proposition-like. They say this thing has a certain property. This thing has a certain cause. This thing has a certain origin, and so forth. Now, the, the really crucial thing, I think, and you know, even Hannah Arendt, your great hero, she, she made this confusion too. It, there is the, the truth. She didn't make any confusion. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I will say what it is. There is. When we say the truth, what we mean is the things that settle whether our beliefs are true. Okay, that's reality. Reality is what fixes what's true. When we make a claim, our claim can be true or false. And it is true when it says the way things are, and it's false when it says how they're not. That's what Aristotle says. To say of what is that it is, and of what is not that it is not, you is can to say, say the it. Truth. I cannot say it. <laughs> yes, it's a beautiful way. thing. It <laughs> says that is all you need to know about truth. It is to say of what is that it is, and of what is not that it's not. Then we look at the then, of course, we have the question, well, 
which, which is it? Is it true or is it false, this belief that we have? That's about knowledge. That's about ascertaining whether the truth... But isn't knowledge the measure of claim against evidence? Yeah, the, so knowledge for me is justifying what you accept is true. And we are often in a position, now justification is fallible. We can be very reasonable, as Jana was saying just a minute ago. We can be very reasonable in believing something false. When the pre-Aristotelians believed that the earth was flat, you know, they were justified in believing that. All the observations that they had made suggested that the earth was flat. It took a genius like Aristotle to realize that facts about what he was observing in the heavens implied that the earth had to be spherical. Now, the, the earth is either spherical or flat. Some people believed it was flat. They were reasonable to do so. They were wrong. Okay? That's about discovering the truth. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, there is the question of how you communicate the truth. Uh, what are the mechanisms by which you most effectively communicate what you know when you know it? Uh, what are the mechanisms that get in the way of that? What are psychological aspects of, of, of people that prevent them from seeing the truth and so on and so forth? Jenna, but these are three... Yeah, sorry, no, I, I think I'm about to say something completely naive that I should probably keep to myself. But, no, um, but it's something like, um, it seems to me that there's certain things about the world that we can't just have true or false propositions about. That that's, that that's not the appropriate way to analyze it. So mm -hmm. if I, I, I mm -hmm. when we come to understanding human relationships or, or what we think we know about somebody, there's simply, I just don't believe our true or false propositions are applicable there. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I mean. Yeah, sorry, sorry, as you're speaking, I'm thinking of my own family and like, all of the fights I have in our family are revolved around this issue, Let's right? Let's fix your family right yeah, now. Yeah, that's why I'm here. That's what Paula said. No, but, but, <laughs> but what I was thinking is even when you said knowledge is the measure of, of the gap between claims and what was it that you had said? Well, the, the, it's the measure of measurement of, of, of claim, claim against evidence. See, but I feel like that's, and, and this is, I'm very saying this very humbly, I feel like that's extremely narrow and a bit arrogant because... That's actually not very humble. It's not but humility. That right. is the definition. <laughs> Go for not, it. No, not what you Naive, said. Naive, arrogant, and, and humble, yay. No, but it could so. be a product of my limited understanding, in all seriousness. But, but why I said that is because it's touching on what you're talking about, but about humanity and about things that are um, true in context when you add a whole bunch of different observations or uh, sensations. Because even in reporting and communicating information, I feel like... I was trying to think about what you said, the, the measure between a claim and then reality, but that, that's then to suggest that you can only gain knowledge when you compare that which is claimed with what is observed, like, you know, empirically something you can observe. Well, I'll, I'll amend that by making very clear that I think observation is actually tricky because common sense and truth need to be unmoored because we used to believe that Earth was flat because it came from our sense perceptions of common sense. Well, we're standing here, it looks pretty, you know, everywhere I look, nobody's toppling over, it looks pretty flat. Right. And that's also the reason why I think gravitational astronomy is so profound because everything we know so far, all of our sense of what is true of the universe has come from what, 480 years of light that, that has come to us, of observation through this one sensory mechanism. And now we have this whole new frontier that can tell us things that contradict our sensory right. intuitions, that reveal levels of truth that are not the same as common sense. And that's because you have that macro context where you know gravity or the world being round or flat, you wouldn't know being here, but being far, you see it and you understand it more complexly. But I don't know. We didn't solve our, my family problems, but <laughs> <next time>. yet. <laughs> Jana, uh, no, I didn't actually ask. Oh, okay. I was just chiming in. Sorry. Uh, interestingly, um, maybe it seems almost like we're being too too connected and too um, limited by our pursuit of truth, right? You know, I was always very surprised coming from Italy. Uh, I was surprised by how much importance Americans put in truth. It, it's, I know that it sounds crazy, but um, it sounded like the worst thing that you could do in the United States was to lie. Yeah. And there's much worse things you can do in Italy than lie. <laughs> you know? So, it's <laughs> so uh, seriously I can totally speaking, relate to that, though. You relate that, to that, too, I, right? That's why I mentioned the brown Egypt, Austria thing. What I was trying to articulate is I went from a world where not just lying, but other things were very permissible, in fact, encouraged and probably normal, yeah. you know? Yeah, 
Uh, expected even, yeah. Can yeah, I? Paul, yeah, you can. I just want to, uh, uh, yeah. just a short question of Ahmed and Maria because I think they're the ones who are most sympathetic to the idea of perspectival truth rather than objective truth. When, well, no, yeah. No. Uh, I just nodded. As long as we don't go into relativism, which I, I, I should have been more clear, that is. Well, because I think you said, you, you see, the, when you say there are many, there are many truths, um, that to me, there is, there's, there's only one thing that's the property of truth. There are many kinds of proposition, of course. There are moral propositions, aesthetic, physical, and so on. But they're not different kinds of... When they're true, they're true all in the same way because they just say of what is that it is. There are also maybe some claims that we make. Some people dispute whether morality is the realm of the true and the false or whether it's just the realm of imperatives. But I just wanted to ask... For those who are sympathetic, you know, when, when Kellyanne Conway says, I'm presenting alternative facts, but you're <laughs> very sympathetic to the idea of my truth versus your truth, what, what criticism do you make of her? I mean, again, maybe this is semantics, but I think there's a difference between facts and reality, and maybe she thinks her alternative facts create an alternative reality, but... Um, oh, suppose she just said, that's my truth. Yeah. And then say, you're, there's my truth and your truth. My truth is that there were Again, more... Again, I, I think the issue is, she, we were talking about something that is not very personal to her. It was like, and again, forgive me if I'm using um, not words that are just Stop specific. Stop apologizing. No, but, no but, more but the apologies. reason is, like, <laughs> when I watch that in live, and as a journalist, as you can imagine, I mean, it's frustrating for anyone to see that, but it's all the more fr frustrating when, for better or worse, your job is to push back and to try and, you know, challenge people who are lying and when the barrage is so relentless and then she took it to the point where she said I think that was not just like an attack on truth and journalism but it was an attack on critical thinking itself because it's like again it's the conundrum you're referring to which is in my mind it's like she didn't say that was her truth she was saying it was an alternative fact and so to parse it with semantics it's like well what the hell is an alternative fact and so what it sounds like to me is it's a fact I don't know how you would define alternative but it's like where there's a choice in which you can choose to prove whether something's verifiable. Whereas in truth, absolute truth at least, you don't have a choice, right? Truth isn't a choice. And, and, and it's... It, I, she could never claim one, one truth versus another truth. She could claim one claim versus this is my claim and this is your claim. But this is yeah. where we go back to the right. proper thing about right. certainty and truth because alternative facts and all other modes of propaganda work at the level of certainty, not at the level of truth. They manipulate certainties. They don't manipulate and cannot ever manipulate truths. Now the question is how do we train people to question their certainties in such a way as to not to allow for that manipulation? I, yeah. I, uh -huh. I, I feel like it's futile. Yeah, this, this point about critical thinking, which I think you're raising also, is what is so dangerous about what it undermines. It's not the actual facts that, that you know, it's so terrible. It's that it's undermining the idea of critical thinking. Without critical thinking, you can't possibly have democracy. Right. Or facts so and fiction. What's the difference if there's no thinking? Well, it's, it's a very, I think, runaway sickness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there questions in the audience? Yes, we start. I, first one here. Um, th yeah, the mic is there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, thank you for all of your presentations and for your great discussions. Um, I have a question, I guess, kind of open up to anybody. Um, the idea of, uh, of mapping truths and of uh, those properties being like almost plots, uh, I think that uh, that, whole, that whole ideology is entirely self-referential. Um, and so I really like the point of, uh, of um, objectivity versus transparency of bias because I think Personally, I think that is kind of the ultimate way to uh, break down all the barriers between people. Um, but uh, kind of what is the aspect, I guess, that uh, yourself has to do with uh, the goal towards finding the truth and towards communicating uh, ideas where we can agree or agree to disagree? I don't think, did you, did you understand the question? I can synthesize it a little more. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's on Twitter. Uh, I guess, uh, what does the individual person versus the idea of, of universal truths, what is the, the, uh, the aspect of the individual person being able to only take in what they, what they receive? I, if this is related to what you said about transparency and objectivity, I could try to answer it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is. So, uh, I, I think you're like talking about the capability or ability to report or to communicate truths based on your if you want to call them perceptions, or in my case, in a professional capacity like reporting. 
Uh, I think it sounds theoretically, logically, uh, that if you were to approach a situation by trying to remove yourself and your humanity and your, pers your, your perceptions, your experiences, your intellect and knowledge, whatever knowledge we've agreed is, is defined as, uh, that that will lead to, you know, this view from nowhere will lead to a more true picture, a more uh, truthful, more accurate picture. And now I'm speaking uh, in a construct that's like specifically about journalism, but that, when I chose to, at a very young age, 21, to pursue journalism, it was really hard for me to wrap my head around how that should be not just an expectation or a strategy as a journalist or as a reporter or a storyteller, but it's, it's something that all of a sudden people were championing in a way that I didn't understand because the way I process, and hopefully this gets to your question, the way I process information is very, not just emotionally, but it's very personal. It's, it's about context, my experiences, past, immediate. And so I realized no matter how hard I tried, I would inevitably fail to remove myself. And then I, then I started questioning the actual purpose of removing oneself. And is that, you know, is that, is that are we kidding ourselves? Are we being in genuine? I, I felt disingenuous each time I tried. Um, and I figured, especially at these times, like, you know, if you want to reach the truth, <laughs> whatever the truth is, I didn't imagine it'd be so hard to, to specify, then you should know your own truth. And that was my truth. And I think that if more people who are in the business of storytelling were to feel comfortable with that, um, that it would hopefully lead to them being able to depict things as accurately as possible based on a kind of comfort with not fearing that they're going to reveal that they have either some sort of bias, whether... Is this inductive versus deductive? <laughs> no. uh, Let me just make a recommendation. Sure. Um, yeah. uh, Carl Sagan actually outlined this in a wonderful thing called the Baloney Detection Kit, which is a <laughs> toolkit for critical thinking that equips you, the individual person, with the tools of how to make, how to discern the most truth with the information you're given, basically. Well, oh, I love that. The Baloney Toolkit. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the lady behind there. Yeah, the, yeah, on the fourth. Yeah, and then I'm gonna come back to you. Yeah, I see. Hi, sorry. thank you. That was such an interesting panel, such an interesting way of curating it. Um, I was. It seemed to me that we were conflating a lot of definitions in the same terms, and also not using words like propaganda, or honesty, or dishonesty. That also relate to this conversation. And also, one more observation before I ask the question. It seemed that the timing of, of having this conversation may drastically change it. So if we were having it um, even hundreds of years ago, that conversation would be so different when uh, the definition of what everybody was seeing was much more in the eye of a single sort of type of um, uh, viewer, right, because you had more uh, power concentrated in a single type of viewer versus now where you have so much more personal information coming um, uh, and, and personal reporting uh, coming into the, the same conversation. So, so where I'm coming with this is I wonder whether um, part of defining what we're comfortable with calling the truth, so not philosophical, but just what, what is comfortable, what is alternative facts, which makes people cringe versus what is comfortably discussed as, you know, I have a different view on the truth. Whether well, that depends in large part on motivation behind the statement. So whether okay. it is acknowledging your own okay. personal bias or stating it like a scientist would, uh, <coughs> I have a thesis and I'm willing to have an open conversation about that thesis versus the sort of the propaganda. Anybody wants to tackle this? It's more like a declaration. Well, uh, yeah. No, I was just going to say something. I don't. I hope this isn't too orthogonal, but um, it's sort of folding in a couple of the points that were brought up, and maybe some things that Maria was talking about. And I know that we've talked about off offline, um, and I do believe that we all have a theory of the world. I just think that that's how we evolved, and we can't process all the information we have. So we have theories of the world, and and things mean different things in the context of those theories of the world. So in that sense, I completely understand this idea that there are things that are true for me that aren't true for other people. And they have to do not with the raw materialistic fact, but 
but with the meaning that I impose and the map in some sense that Maria describes, which is used not just to understand each other, but to understand this auditorium and to understand this conversation, to understand the historical context in which we're speaking. And so yes, I think that as in, in a different historical context, we have a different theory of the world. And hopefully the healthy attitude is such that we are continually revising that theory in the face of new evidence and doing so systematically and devotedly in order to keep the theory from becoming opinion. But, but this devotion to systematically factoring in new evidence and revising and refining the theory, I think that is our best bet at truth. And to some extent, the best we can ever hope for is kind of asymptote towards you know, the same reality. It's kind of the best that I think we can hope for. The late, no, there was the, the lady with the, oh, you're not raising your hand anymore then? Oh yeah, there's it was there. there huh? There's a crutch. There's Someone's also a crutch. A crutch. They the might crutch just be threatening first. us though. <laughs> oh, I have a question. Where is the microphone? I don't know, my Hi there. Ladies. Yeah, no, I wasn't threatening anybody. I give um, up. I give. I, I give the microphone. Microphone ladies decide because I can't control oh, do, them do anymore. Oh, people have the microphone. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Whoever wants to go can go. Okay. Okay, I'll go ahead. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what is the part of morality when we talk about social truths, and we know that depending on our standpoint that can vary widely, so it's a question a little bit for Paul who was speaking of absolute truth. And I am wondering about scientific truths, and I think I'm following up on what was said just by the lady before now who spoke. Scientific truths evolves in time. It is not immutable and certain truths are contested or are challenged or are uh, defeated over time. Likewise, the moral as I think we're conflating in when we speak truth, social truth, as in opinions and scientific truth. What well, is the, the question, sir? We're because my question is whether yeah. we are not conflating ah. here the social truth and the social aspects of truth and scientific aspect of truth, and each are very different on the way. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, my, the, the, the most the most important point that I would that I would try to make is precisely not to conflate. It's not a, the distinction between scientific and social truth. It's the difference between what is true and what is accepted to be true. Okay. So Ex science and socialism. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, that's, I'm just asking. I'm honestly, that's what it says. You see, look. When you make a claim there is a fact of the matter as to whether it's true. When you make a factual claim, there is a fact. Of, that fact is settled by the world. It's settled by reality. It's not settled by our opinion. Mm -hmm. We may all agree that something is true, and yet it be false. That was what was true when people believed the earth was flat. They all believed the same thing. They were perfectly reasonable to believe it. They were all wrong. Okay. Easy. And this can happen now. Okay? And then there is the question, um, what is accepted as true and why is it as accepted as true? Is it accepted as true because of evidence or is it accepted as true because of wishful thinking or is it accepted as true because it serves our collective purpose to believe it to be true? All of these things can be raised, but the, all the interesting fact, the questions about acceptance, about belief, why people believe certain things, whether they're rational to believe them, are very different from whether in the end those beliefs are true and that's settled by reality, not by you. Unless but what the, about the, the difference between... The proposition concerns you. I actually, my question kind of relates to yours, which is, do you differentiate between fact and truth? No. Well, okay. you see, I don't agree. Well, can, can I just <laughs> add... Can, 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 can we pause here to consider the relationship between fact and truth? Because fact can usually mean an isolated bit of information, whereas truth is a relational framework in which facts correlate with one another and build a richer understanding of something. No. I would agree. No. I mean, I it's 97 no. versus... Like Donald Trump, no. <laughs> <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong. 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 <laughs> Sad. Wrong. Sad. I never thought I'd be in this. <laughs> Someone said his... I heard his name. By the way. <laughs> no, also, I had a Paul. quick question. Paul has he been said it twice, his name, actually. Or three times. <laughs> Me? Yeah. Yeah, you know, the worst thing that can happen is indifference. Yeah. <laughs> I, Jana, I can I ask a quick question about Weber? In the end, was he thought to be wrong 
or was it his instrument wow. that did not detect the, mm -hmm. because in the end the waves are there, right? Yes, in fact those two black holes that collided about 1.3 billion years ago have been washing over the Earth for a very long time and the black holes might have been orbiting each other for five billion years, it's conceivable, we're not sure, which means that for the past several billion, for, you know, a few billion years those gravitational waves have been passing over us. That it also means that when LIGO is operational in the year 2000, those same, that same source was sending us gravitational waves. However, it's not until the final 200 milliseconds that the energy is great enough to ring even LIGO, which was so phenomenally sensitive. Now, Joe's instrument was nowhere near as sensitive. It was also detecting a different frequency. Those black holes collided in the human auditory range. It literally means if you were floating by those black holes in the absence of air and anything your eardrums could conceivably ring in response, you would literally hear the gravitational wave. So Joe's instrument was both a different frequency and infinitely less, well not infinitely, okay, I'm exaggerating. That's not true. Um, <laughs> but you know, significantly, significantly less sensitive. What would and it that's sound what they like, felt like. like the, so the black holes, you, I was going to play it for you, but I, I didn't. Um, but it, Cal is uh, doing a great can job. You, yeah, just can you turn it as I'm a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're so much wimpier than you would expect. Now, they, it's a, called a chirp. They go, Whoop. that's what it sounds like. Oh my that's God. what it sounds like. And it, and it is right that the human That animation is so range. beautiful. Mm. Yes, that is, I should emphasize, a, a proper, fully relativistic mathematical simulation as opposed so to a cartoon. Beautiful. And what it shows is what the bending of the path of light on the curved space looks like if you had a galaxy behind them. So if there's Fantastic. no other sources of light, I'd be showing you a black slide. <laughs> so you have to have the, some kind of galaxy a or source screen. behind it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, so that's a full mathematical model of what the collision would have been like had we slowed it down drastically. I'm gonna get one last question and then we'll continue in the drinks. because. Yeah, that, do you have the microphone? Did they give it to you? Yay. He was holding up his hand for a while. I have seen him, yeah. Uh, thank you. Just two quick offerings. Uh, I am a writer of long-form nonfiction, uh, and I was once on a panel with Ian Frazier, Sandy Frazier, and we were asked whether we read novels, and I said the novels I read, and, and he said, I don't read novels. And I looked at him kind of stunned. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, you know, in a novel where it says Joe was walking down the street, all I can think is, no, he wasn't. <laughs> which is, uh, which is uh, but having said that, I often taught a course called The Fiction of Nonfiction, which is about all the fictive elements of nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And I required of my students, and it drove them crazy because they were uh, half of them were journalism students, that they use an I voice. And I think, by the way, that's one of the things that hasn't been talked about here, is voice. I and you use, point. yeah, there you go. Yeah, and, also and you use the, the I voice, voice not out of megalomania, <laughs> but out of modesty. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to the point is that this is one person's best attempt to get to the truth. And over time, over a career, you develop another word that hasn't been used here, authority, or not. Um, mm -hmm. Which would also well, it's almost like trust. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. It's, it's kind of what I was saying is what makes you authoritative is not appearing to be impartial. What makes you authoritative exactly. is being transparent, being yeah. accountable, and being honest about your voice, to use right. the word you wanted right. us to right. use. Right, right. And, uh, and I just think, mm -hmm. at the last point I would just make very quickly is that you have authority and you have authenticity. Authority is something you accrue over time. Authenticity is something you achieve at little moments and you fall away from. That was enough. What were you about to say, Maria? I was going to say, I don't want to embarrass Jana, but her novel, uh, which is fantastic, and it's called A Madman Dreams of Turing Machines, it draws very heavily on the biographies of Alan Turing and Kurt Gödel, but it uses fiction in a way to raise questions about the meaning of their lives and the meaning of their ideas and their mathematical and, and philosophical legacy. And Wittgenstein makes an appearance and all of that in a way that if you just read the biographies, the facts of these people's lives, you wouldn't get that far. So the fiction is not mm. uh, it's lies. Like it, it's it's, it's yeah. an amplification of precisely that lacuna between truth and meaning that cannot be done in any other way. And it's done so beautifully. Nice. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, 
Mm, you are not the next in line, but no. <laughs> okay, okay. I just want to ask. Get, wait for the microphone, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if everyone just down the line, I just adore this presentation. Mm -hmm. So, who do you follow on Twitter and social media? That's just. <laughs> Maria Popova. <laughs> <laughs> we all follow each other. Yeah. Okay, no, no, but I mean, outside of each other, interesting to just, your answer to, to who do you follow in terms of social media and where you get your news and what drives you to these individuals? It's a little bit of a big question, and it's one that you could solve by going onto their Twitter accounts yeah. and yeah. find it. But no, this is a question that we can talk about later on but, but, but yeah go ahead I'll say I actually have been off not looking at Twitter in the last I would say two months because the the kind of had a hard vortex of opinions reacting to opinions makes it very hard to to get onto any truth and most uh, people I follow have been dead for a long time so yeah uh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> no it, it, it's 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 so true in in the sense that uh, I personally had been feeling silly about posting anything about design, which is what I've always posted, because there are such important things going on that I would feel frivolous. And at the same time, I don't know, I haven't done no, much. Keep posting, please. No, uh, no but I, I want to ask, thank you for all your questions. I want to ask one last question that demands a very, very quick answer of each of you. Maria was talking about Virginia Woolf having the seizure of truth because she understood that the flowers was the mound and the earth and the lawn, etc. Did you have uh, momentary instantaneous seizures in front of something that made you feel like you were really grasping the truth? Very quickly, Ustah Ahmed. Uh, um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head for, mm -hmm. for, in, you know, for the sake of time, but I will tell you that that short video that I shared and other encounters I've had in the last few months, yeah. especially in the past year, have left me, when I say disillusioned, I mean it, <laughs> Extre deeply disillusioned because it seems like everything you're describing about why you couldn't be on Twitter the past two months and like how difficult it is, when you see that start playing out in reality in a space that you've lived in for 10 years that you would have never imagined something to be unfolding as it was truly in front of your eyes, or, it's, um, I, I'm speaking specifically about protests. It, it, I think I did have maybe one of those. Yeah, no, moments. it seemed to me from that video. You're saying you're disillusioned because we are... Uh, it, it's almost a feeling of efficacy, like is it even worth me doing this? I feel like all of a sudden, like an, it's a bit of an existential thing, like yeah. you're going through the motions of journalism, this side, the other side, the polarization and how it's manifesting itself in people's opinions, people's perceptions of each other in real time. To see it online is one thing, because you can turn away and it's like, you know, there's like the funny video that you can watch after to make you feel better. But in real life, when you have to keep reporting, and it's funny, I've reported all over the world and working for Vice, I'll just say very quickly, in some of the worst places in the world, child molestation, war zones, all that stuff. And I have to tell you, like the last few months here in the US have left me feeling these kinds of things, much more so than I did even in those places, I think because of context. Aye. Um, because yeah. of the relativity and, and this isn't... It's but keep pushing on trust. I think that's, yeah, I that's agree. your secret. I Paul, agree. seizure. Yes, yes seizure. Yes, seizure. Many seizures. Um, Many seizures. Yeah, I mean... You don't need seizures. You know already. <laughs> yeah. There are, these, mm -hmm. there are these aha moments isn't when you it understand the, the, something. No, I will never say that expression. I hate it with all aha my heart. Moment. Yeah, my God. Yeah. Seizure. Seizure. <laughs> seizure. Seizure is better? <laughs> but much better. Not to me, but anyway, um, I don't know, when you understand what it is about consciousness that makes it difficult to see how it could be a purely physical phenomenon. That was, so. Mm -hmm. um, Emily. So I don't have one specific example, but going back to what um, the journalism professor said, I think sometimes the only truths that I feel like I can obtain right now are individual truths. Like sometimes, and okay. I think sometimes I've been talking more about, I've been using the word fiction, but it's just stories and people who are able to tell a compelling story, whether it's through fiction or art or film or whatever. Jenna? Well, I, um, I tend to be very mathematically uh, oriented in my work. So I would say that for me, it could be something very calculational. And um, there's nothing more gratifying than believing something or having an intuition that something is true and proving yourself wrong mathematically and force you know 
going through the struggle of seeing it anew it's and shedding yeah. some old mm -hmm. intuition and accepting something radically new. And I, I think the strongest time I had that experience was with relativity when I first learned relativity. I used to think of myself as before relativity and after relativity. <laughs> <laughs> Maria. Um, in December, I was uh, visiting a friend in San Francisco and I was working outside in her garden and my peripheral vision and this kind of creaturely instinct was caught on something and I look up and I see this little shiny red leaf twirling and at first I thought, oh, it's falling, it's on its way down, but it just kept twirling and it was astonishing. And so I couldn't get close enough. Eventually I kind of circle around and the sun hit at just the right angle to illuminate a very fine spider's web holding it. It was just dancing in midair and in that moment, I realized that, first of all, I understood why you know, people have had witchcraft and superstition and all these kinds of things, but it also made me realize how many things are there in life in which we just don't see the spider's web. We give another explanation of the, tree, the, the leaf twirling, but the spider's web is there. That's quite beautiful. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it was nice. Well, I'm going to say, no, that's really nice. But my, my seizures come since I wanted to be an astrophysicist when I was 14. My seizures come when I see something like those black holes fusing. I just, uh, you know, the micro and the macro are really the way there, right? And the individual and the collective. Well, it's been a wonderful night as usual without any answers, but with great <laughs> conversations. And uh, I thank you all for coming. We're, let's go outside. Let's have some kind of so-so snacks and some all right wine and keep on talking and thank you so much.